concerning the church of our Lord, and we're down to the major prophet known as Ezekiel. Of course, he was one of the four that we know of major prophets. I emphasize again, although probably now we know it, that they're called major because their books are longer than those we call minor prophets. He was a prophet from the southern kingdom of Judah. And his name means God strengthens or strengthened by God. And his active ministry, as far as we know, was roughly 22 years. And the book was completed somewhere around 565 B.C. He and uh, Daniel, who we've already studied, about the same age, and they were about 20 years younger than the prophet Jeremiah, who was working in <coughs> Jerusalem as it was besieged at the same time Ezekiel was already over in Babylon. And he overlapped the end of Jeremiah's ministry and the beginning of <coughs> Daniel's work as a prophet. Like Jeremiah, he was a priest, but called to be a prophet of God. Now, if you turn over and look at Ezekiel chapter 34, and you notice uh, verse 11, and then on down through the chapter about verses 22 and 23, you'll see that he'll say, But thus saith the Lord God, indeed I myself will search for my sheep, and seek them out. He talks about the next verse, saving my flock. They won't any longer be a prey, and that he'll judge between uh, the different sheep. And he says, I will establish one shepherd over them, and shall uh, feed them. My servant David, he shall feed them and be their shepherd. Now Ezekiel the prophet then, working with the captives already in Babylon, saw the church of our Lord as a sheepfold with one shepherd, David, over them. The sheepfold with one shepherd over the fold was a familiar sight to all those people of that part of the world in Ezekiel's day. It still is in some areas of the Middle East and places um, something to see. And there's always uh, the cause of the situation, the scene I can still visualize as we were traveling down from Jerusalem to, to the Dead Sea and then over to Jericho because it's a very sharp drop. And I looked up on the hills on either side and there was a shepherd and the sheep all lined up behind him. One long line. They were moving right along with the staff in his hand. So that was, uh, uh, that still goes on as far as that's concerned. And thus it was imprinted upon their minds as a natural part of their daily lives. So it's a fitting object lesson to reveal certain aspects of the church of our Lord. Now notice in John 10 in the New Testament, verses 14 through 16, that Jesus himself said, I am the good shepherd. And he said, I know my sheep. I am known by my sheep. He said, as the Father knows me, even so I know the Father. Then he said, and I lay down my life for my sheep. Then he said, too, and other sheep I have which are not of this fold, speaking of the Jews who were his people under the law of Moses. He says, them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. Of course, the Jews didn't understand at the time that they made this statement about the inclusion of the Gentiles. And as you go through the book of Acts, you see that developing and how God got it over to the Jewish church that everybody has a right to the gospel, both Jew and Gentile. But we do see that Jesus then, the son of David according to the flesh, was and is the fulfillment of Ezekiel's vision relative to the one sheepfold and the one shepherd. I hope you're taking note and realizing as we look at each one of these as the prophets saw the church, that you get a full picture of the church by the way that each one of these prophets saw the church. 
the sheep following the shepherd then is a beautiful picture of the church of the living God made up of Christians who are of course following Jesus Christ. Then we come to Zechariah who is one of the twelve minor prophets and his name means God remembers or God has remembered. He was born over in Babylon and brought by his grandfather to Palestine when the Jewish exiles returned under Zerubbabel and Joshua the high priest. Now notice this is not the Joshua of the Exodus. This is Joshua the high priest uh, coming back after the Babylonian captivity. Zechariah was a younger contemporary <coughs> of the prophet Haggai. <coughs> Now, this prophet had a series of eight night visions in one troubled night, about 519 B.C. The first five were visions of comfort, and the last three of those visions were visions of judgment. When you look at Zechariah, you see that he was a prophet who exercised not that all didn't have vital roles, but especially a vital role in causing the resumption of the work on Zerubbabel's temple. Under Zerubbabel, they got things going, but then they got interested in their own houses and let the temple of the Lord uh, sit there and went ahead and took care of themselves first. It was uh, Zechariah who got that thing changed around in the order that it ought to be. Zechariah saw the church as a temple as well as an open fountain. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. The sinners plunge beneath that blood. There's all their guilty stains. The temple and the fountain were both again very familiar to Zechariah and to the people of his day. Let me stop and emphasize again. If you look at these prophets, I've long said to preachers and to myself that if you're going to be an effective preacher, do not stay long away from the prophets. Well, one of the things we're learning as we look at how these prophets saw the church, they took what was right there that the people understood thoroughly, that they were around every day, events they were going through, and then they would take it and teach them about something they didn't know about, didn't understand. And that was the church. So the temple and the open fountain were both things they were familiar with. Each one of them served well to give deeper understanding on pertinent aspects of the features of the church because the church is still hundreds of years into the future from the time these prophets were as to coming into existence. The work on Zerubbabel's temple had been stopped and guess why because of opposition uh, sometimes to get things done like God wants them done and when he wants them done you got to overcome opposition a lot of times that starts just with you and with me there's always excuses you can make and I can make and they seem good to us and they justify ourselves in our own eyes for not doing what we know the Bible says ought to be done. And we're always going to let George do it. <laughs> and George is not going to do it, his little boy said one time, Brother Warren's sermon. We have to resolve that I will do my service to God no matter what happens. God's will is going to be done in my life. In Ezra 4 and verse 2, uh, we learned that the Samaritans had come to Jerusalem and the heads of the father's houses, and they'd made this proposal. We want to work with you. We want to build with you. Uh, we seek your God as you do. And we sacrificed to him since the days of Ezra Haddon, king of Assyria, who brought us here. That sounds all right, especially for the attitude of, you know, the go along to get along and we just returned from seven years of captivity and we want to show everybody we're fine folks and good neighbors. 
but they didn't set things out really like it was. There was no dedication on their part to the law of Moses to be what the law required of them. And when those Samaritans were denied their request, then they said, well, if we can't be a part of it and have our influence in it, then we're going to mess it all up. So they weakened the hands of the people of Judah. They hired counselors against them. And they frustrated their purpose all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia. Even to the reign of Darius, commonly called Darius, king of Persia, an interval of some 16 long years. Now I remember, and I have in my library, it's available if anybody would like to have it. In other, in other words, you could purchase it. We never lived through that because we live in an easy age. When the church, after the debacle of the apostasy of the 19th century with the formation of the apostate Christian church denomination, Brethren were struggling everywhere, that is, those brethren who sought to retain ancient, pure, primitive New Testament Christianity. And uh, they were pretty well attacked by a great many, not only the denominations, but also those that went into the Christian church. I remember one brother making a report, preaching in Abilene in about 1903. And he was preaching in a tent. And he said that after he set up his tent, he would preach every night, but then he would spend the next day sewing up the rents in the tent because the Christian church people had tried to cut it all up during the night after he had preached. So he would sew it up and he would do it again. Now, if you read the papers back at that time, that kind of thing was happening routinely all over the place. When have you known that kind of opposition? If you go back to the very beginnings of the effort to restore the New Testament church in the early 1800s, it was a regular thing for uh, the people, especially by the time the 1820s, 30s, and 40s came along, to have great opposition to what was going on because people lived closer to the Bible then. It was about the only book they had, and they fully believed it was the Word of God. So when men came preaching, if you got one Bible worshiping one God and there's one Savior, why can't we all be one if we'll just accept the Bible and the Bible only? We'll be Christians only, the only Christians. And that appealed to a lot of people. And when you preach that kind of thing around, then it got other folks who weren't open to it all upset. And so they had all sorts and sizes of problems in those days. I suggest to you again that if we begin to bear down like we ought to today on the immoralities of this country and say the things that need to be said, where they need to be said, that you might find out rather quickly just exactly how much we could very well be in straits when it comes to persecution. But we can't get congregations hardly to say anything publicly such as running ads in the papers to challenge to debate these people, making it clear these things are wrong. People aren't used to that. That's not Christianity. Christianity is just get along, get along, smile at one another, pat each other on the back, tell everybody how good they are, don't upset anything. You go to your church, I'll go to mine, we'll all get to heaven together, we're all headed down the same path. But if we just believe in Christ, Etc., 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 ad infinitum, ad nauseum, and give me direction. So that's, that's the thing. So sometimes we are, though we think we're straight down the line, maybe we are, it's what we believe, what we worship, organization, church, but are we really taking the battle to the enemy? Are we really saying anything that's going to really upset anybody? I wonder. Well, these prophets weren't like that. They said plenty that upset folks. Not because they wanted people upset, but because the truth upsets people who are living contrary to it. Do you like to be told you're wrong and then conclude he's right in telling me I'm wrong? That doesn't make you feel too good. Most people, I'm sad to say, when they are wrong, bow their neck at those who pointed out. That's why a certain person about 2,000 years ago got nailed to a cross. 
exactly why. And he was perfect. These prophets, Haggai and Zechariah, then set about to stir up the people. Particularly Zerubbabel, the governor, Yeshua, the high priest, to do what? To resume the work on the temple. And it was resumed in the second year of Darius, and it was completed in the sixth year of Darius. So it took four years to start out with what was there and then complete it. And upon the resumption of that work, Zechariah was particularly active in his own encouragement of Zerubbabel. Let me pause here and say this about encouragement. A lot of times people know exactly what the Bible says they ought to be doing. But all of us can get distracted to the affairs of this present world. Guess who knows that better than anybody else? Satan. So we don't carry out what we admit is God's will and is our responsibility to do. Well, that's where the encouragers can come along. The exhorters can come along. It's not a matter of new knowledge that you do not know that you need to know so you can do right. It's simply people who are encouraging us and exhorting us to be busy in doing what we already know. And that's a big word. And notice that he announced in about chapter 4 and verse 9, the hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of the temple. His hands shall also finish it. Then you'll know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. It's one thing to begin to think, it's another thing to finish it. How many people have started on something that was good, wholesome, and right? But because of this, that, and the other, that didn't make it too easy to finish it, it went unfinished. Well, Zerubbabel was faced with a great mountain of obstacles. Zechariah asked in Zechariah 4 and verse 7, uh, Who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you shall become a plain. He shall bring forth the capstone, the shots of grace, grace to it. The idea being, there's a big mountain in my way. Well, it doesn't have to remain there. Call the bulldozers out. <laughs> and let's make it flat. That should be the disposition of every member of the church toward getting done what God says ought to be done. There's an obstacle. Well, don't we expect obstacles? How's the devil going to stop the work of the Lord in your life personally or in the life of this congregation or any other without obstacles? Now, we need to learn to identify those obstacles. <coughs> And some of them would be right in our own mind and attitude toward ourselves and our own attitude toward our brethren. Not in ignorance of the obligations laid out in the Word of God, but just the fact that a lot of times it's, I'll get around to it. But it never happens. Well, within this frame of references relative to Zerubbabel's temple work, God said to the prophet Zechariah in chapter 6, 12, and 15, Speak to him and say to him, Thus says the Lord of hosts. Then he says, Behold the man whose name is Branch. Branch. From his place he shall branch out and he shall build the temple of the Lord. He shall build the temple of the Lord. He shall bear the glory. He will sit and rule on the throne. He will be a priest on his throne. And the council of peace shall be between them both. Now let me start with this by saying the council of peace. If you go to the New Testament and you look at the gospel and how it's revealed and you study about it, it's the gospel of peace. Well, Jesus is the Prince of Peace. But may I remind you that Jesus said, I came not to bring peace, but a sword. Now, wait a minute. Prince of Peace, that's Jesus Christ, the Savior, the Son of God. Died for us because He loved us. But He came to bring a sword. He didn't just bring peace. But the Gospel is the Gospel of Peace. And the prophecy talks about that His counsel shall be one of peace. What's going on here? Well, there's a little thing called each individual with a human will. 
and whether they really seek after truth and love the truth. And that's what the difference is. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. The Gospel is the Gospel of Peace. But when people do not want peace on the terms of Jesus Christ, there will be no peace. And thus he talks about houses divided, <coughs> with mothers separated from daughters, etc., etc. All of that has to do with somebody love the truth or the gospel of peace. And somebody did. So there's where the problem is. So don't let it sound like a contradiction because it's not. The gospel is the only way peace can be made between sinful man and God. And when you meet the terms of the gospel, the gospel of peace, from the Prince of Peace, with the attitude of, Speak, Lord, thy servant heareth, command and I will obey. Receive with meekness the engrafted or implanted word which is able to save your soul. Then it's all a matter of peace through reconciliation of the gospel and your belief and obedience to the truth and the Lord adds in His church. But if you don't believe it, if you want to war against what you know the Bible says, either say, well, I don't believe the Word of God anyway, or I don't like what you said, or my parents and grandparents and great-grandparents have always believed it this way, so who am I to change? Then there's a problem. So you have to understand how it can be called gospel of peace and yet be a sword. Or how he is the prince of peace and yet he brought a sword to bring about division. But here we see then that it is the council of peace that uh, the branch would bring to the world. Well, from that grand announcement, Zerubbabel was to learn at least Four truths. One of them was a, spirit, a spiritual temple was to be built by branch, by the branch, Christ. It would be Zerubbabel. That the branch would be both the king and the priest. Well, that wasn't quite the norm of things at that day and time. We'll add this to it too. Christ is the only one that is prophet, priest, and king. The branch would sit and rule on his throne. And he would be a priest on his throne. So the combination of a priest and a king was an entirely new dimension for the temple. It was far to the law of Moses and the Levitical priesthood and the way the Jews approached God through the temple worship and so forth. It necessarily projected a rule and a role which had characterized only one other man. He's referred to in Hebrews. He lived in the days of Abraham. And that was Melchizedek. King of Salem. And that word Salem means peace. He was a priest of God, most high, as I said, during the time of Abraham. So, in short, the branch, Christ, would sit and rule on his throne when he was also a priest on his throne. And the writer of Hebrews spent a lot of time saying, Christ is high priest. He would have been high priest if he was on this earth. The law of Moses was still going on because he was the tribe of Judah. The priest came from the tribe of Levi. But Christ is high priest. What's the conclusion? The law has been changed. And we're under the gospel system, the New Testament system. That's how he can be the high priest. That's how he can be king. And he is God's prophet. As you read in Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. The vision of the temple which Zechariah saw had its culmination when, now back to the Hebrew letter again, the Hebrews writer in Hebrews 6.20 stated to Jesus that he had been, having become a high priest forever after whose order? The order of Melchizedek. It's interesting how these things fit in the right and divided word, 2 Timothy 2.15. They never violate these, these um, particular types they never run ahead long into one another and contradict one another. The point to be emphasized is that Christ is priest now. And therefore, He is sitting on His throne now. And that destroys the premillennial contention that there's yet to be a kingdom in the future where Christ will be crowned king. He is already king. 
He has been king since the church, the kingdom was established, Acts 2, almost 2,000 years ago. In fact, Peter declared him sitting at the right hand of God at the time he was preaching. He was sitting on his throne as priest and king. In Hebrews 9, 11, but Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with a greater and a more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, this material world. Revelation 17, 14, speaking of Christ, that He's Lord of lords and King of kings, and those who are with Him are called chosen and faithful. Paul wrote 1 Corinthians 15, 25 through 26, He must reign until He puts all enemies under His feet. And of course, that last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Now, in the latter part of Zechariah's life, and decades after Zerubbabel's temple had been completed, Zechariah saw the church as a fountain, an open fountain. Chapter 13, verse 1, In that day a fountain shall be opened for the house of David and for the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and uncleanness. Now, it's strange that Nicodemus would come in John 3 records. And Jesus says, well, you're, you're knowledgeable of the Old Testament, aren't you? But he didn't understand this. He didn't understand being need, needed to be cleaned. He thought he was all right with God because he was born of the seed of Abraham through Jacob. But didn't he know Zechariah? Didn't he know what he said? I wonder what went through his mind regarding this fountain open for the house of David for the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and clean. Because that wasn't what he was thinking. He had no concept of a spiritual birth as Jesus taught in John 3, 3 and 5. In Jerusalem and throughout Palestine, what we need to understand that generally is a dry climate, so fountains and springs were very important and they would be located in certain places. They were essential for life and early settlements of that region then clustered around them and built up around them because they had to have water. So the open fountain which Zechariah saw was well within the objects, symbols, and figures of speech of Zechariah's day. People had no problem seeing whether they understand the application of the story. They had no problem seeing what he was talking about. This fountain which Zechariah saw was noticed not at that time open, but it would be open in that day or at a particular point in time, somewhere out there in the distant future to the time in which you lived. You know, those people look forward to these things being fulfilled even as we think of the Lord coming again or the end of the world. Except that it anchored itself more to time we look at the end of the world and Christ's second coming and that's the end of time and all material things. But yet it's out there in our future whether it's a second from now or a year from now or a thousand years from now. So they still looked at these things as future and that's my point. The fountain would be open for sin and for uncleanness. That is, it would be for the purification of sin. Not some sort of bodily or ceremonial uncleanness. This concept is that the fountain would flow, and that's the reason these people years ago wrote these songs, for the precious blood of the Savior. When the Roman soldier used the spear to pierce the Savior's side, there came forth uh, blood and water. Then and there, if you want to locate it, specifically at the crucifixion, at that moment, at that time, it was open removing sins and uncleanness. And it would be preached then in its fullness of the first Pentecost following the resurrection and ascension of Christ. So wonder that we as Christians sing what I said a moment ago. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunge beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. Well, in closing this brief study over the last two or three weeks, Three points need to be made. They need to be underlined in our minds. They need to be stressed for eternal emphasis. 
First of all, before God made man, He made a plan. A plan of redemption for man even before man sinned. God was already with His love to save man. God knew for the outset that if He had made man His own image, that He had made man His own image, that is an intelligent free moral agent. There would not only be possibility, probability of sin, but for that matter, the certainty of it. Because God is omniscient. He knows all the object of knowledge. Man's a free moral agent. God's omniscience does not handicap man's free moral agency. Because God knows about things that happen in man's life doesn't mean the man can't choose. He just knows what he'll do. God loved us enough to plan for us before we ever were. God chose us in Christ, if we're Christians, before the foundation of the world was ever laid. Ephesians 1 and verse 4, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings and heavenly places in Christ, as He chose us from the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. He made that fact known through the church. And Paul in Ephesians chapter 3, 10 through 11 makes it clear to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God may be known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places according to the eternal purpose which He accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. Surely we see that the church is not some sort of accident or something thought up as an afterthought. What a great responsibility the church has to make known the manifold wisdom of God to the world by preaching the gospel to people. And the question is, are we doing it like we know we ought to? Through one means or another, many of the prophets receive visions and or pronouncements relative to the church. These revelations and pronouncements, however, were necessarily set forth by, as we said all through this study, by means of symbols and figures of speech, which were within the bounds of the prophets as well as the people's day-to-day -day experiences and activities. To understand them, we must carry our mind back with that in mind, to study it from that perspective. In so doing, we see something of the careful, meticulous planning of God for His work. Thus, the importance of the church is further emphasized and demonstrated by the careful and painstaking preparation for it beginning before the foundation of the world in the mind of God. And it continued throughout the Old Testament gradually being revealed. No wonder that the Holy Spirit told the Apostle Paul to tell us in Romans chapter 15, 4, for whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. We learn that God then is a God of order and design. He plans His work and He works His plan. And the church is a vital part of His plan. May we ever show proper respect and consideration for the precious bride of Christ, the church, if you're a Christian, that's what you're a part of. May we ever be faithful members of that church until heaven is our home. So go back when you've got time and spend a lot more time studying the church of the prophet Saul. And you'll have better preparation for appreciating it when you get into the New Testament because all that Old Testament is laid the groundwork for what you see as a reality in the New Testament. If you're not a member of the Lord's church, you're not a Christian. If you're not a Christian, you're lost. Before time was, God prepared for the way to save you from your sins before you ever even sinned. So why reject the plan? Why reject the time He's given so that you can become a child of God and be ready for a living eternity in heaven? If you need to obey the gospel, then believe in Christ as the Son of God, repent of your sins, confess your faith in Him, then be baptized into Christ for the remission of sins and live faithfully in that church 
that the whole Bible reveals down through the ages and in which the gospel presents to you. And by that gospel, you can be a part of it. As a child of God, are you living as you know you ought to live in the church? I'm not talking about normal, faithful growth and development. I'm talking about things that you can rule out of your life or add to it that you're not doing. And so we urge you, if you need to repent, to do that and confess those sins and pray God for forgiveness. If you need to obey the truth, then we invite you to come while we stand in sin.